Russian Civil War, Reds versus Whites. My name is Peter Rolberg. I'm a professor at the George Washington University, and uh, I've been associated with IRIS for quite a few years. And uh, one of the topics of Malena Royal, my esteemed colleague and current director of the Institute for European Russian Eurasian Studies, is Russian nationalism and memory politics. So this is a topic that came very naturally to her. Let me say in the beginning a few words about the uh, authors and the panelists. Malen Norell is a very well-known specialist on Russia, but also on Central Asia, on the Arctic. And uh, with regards to Russia, she has been focusing on uh, nationalism, on Eurasianism, and other aspects of uh, Russian history with an impact on current Russian politics. Um, as well, she has uh, authored and uh, edited numerous books and articles in these fields. And this is one book that came out in a new series called Russian Shorts with Bloomsbury Academic um, in Britain. And uh, so this is a real promising uh, series. And I'm glad that uh, at the beginning of this series stands this really uh, thought provoking uh, book. Margarita Karnesheva, her co-author, is an uh, independent researcher. She has a PhD from the University of Kansas, and her fields of interest are 20th century history with focus on Siberia, military issues, memory politics. The panelists, uh, let me start with Eric Lohr. He's the James Billington Chair of Russian Culture and History at American University. He's the author of two monographs on Russian citizenship and nationalizing the Russian Empire that appeared uh, with uh, were published with Harvard University Press in 2003 and 2012, respectively. Nina Tumarkin is the Catherine Wasserman Davis Professor of Slavic Studies and a Professor of History at Wellesley College. Uh, the most famous book, uh, I'm just saying this as a uh, grateful reader, is uh, Lenin Lives, a Lenin Cult um, in Russia, and uh, also a book on the cult of World War II in Russia. Alexander Verkhovsky is the founder and director of the SOVA Center for Information and Analysis. Uh, he's a human rights activist with a long history of um, uh, Samizdat uh, 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 publications. He's a specialist on nationalism, on hate crimes, on religion and politics, and extremism. He has been uh, uh, with the Wilson Center a couple of times giving talks there. And among his books, uh, I found publications, found one on Vladimir Zhirinovsky, on xenophobia and other related topics. And last but not least, Boris Kalanitsky is a professor of history at the European University in St. Petersburg. He's one of the leading specialists on the 1917 revolution. He has been a visiting professor in the United States, University of Illinois, Princeton, Yale, but also Tartu, Tübingen and other places. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to our listeners. And let's start with the two authors, Marlene Laurel and Margarita Karnasheva, who will say a few words about the book, about their purpose, why they picked this po this topic. And after that, we'll turn to the panelists. Marlene, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Peter, for chairing this event. And I wanted to thank our four discussion for finding the time to read the book in, in what should have been an, a triple AAS <laughs> book uh, discussion originally. And so, yeah, Margarita and I will be presenting, or I will be presenting for the two of us, so we don't uh, spend too much time and say some few words broadly about the, the, the goal of the book. Uh, let me share my screen if it will work. Yes, should be working now. So, um, I mean, as, as you can imagine, the, the question of the rehabilitation of the white movement and the memory of the civil war has been really less studied than what we know about the Second World War. And so we found that interesting that there were this kind of knowledge gap around the memory of the of the civil war. At the same time, it's a great way to discuss a lot of things about contemporary Russia. It's a window into what can be or is trying to develop to be developed as a counter narrative to Soviet history. It's give us a opportunity to discuss how a new set of values are elaborated about the role of orthodoxy in the, the country cultural identity. It's also allowed to discuss the strategies of Euro Europeanizing Russian history and reintegrating the legacy of interwar immigration into today's Russia. 
and indirectly it discuss the current memory war that Russia is uh, uh, facing with its Western neighbor and the issue of the legality of the Soviet regime. So we found it was really a wonderful topic to kind of enter into many aspects of today's Russian society and culture through these uh, uh, small windows of the, the memory of the white movement and the, of the civil war. The book is divided in four chapters, quite small, because that the goal of the series, Russia's Shorts, to be a, a brief and available, like uh, uh, open to, to a broad audience. We have a first chapter that I must say we really enjoy writing about late Soviet culture. And it was really, I mean, at least for me, a, a discovery to see how much in fact, it's Soviet, late Soviet culture that recreated this romanticized image of white officer as being very genuine patriot, as patriot as the Bolshevik, and even in some films, more patriot than the Bolshevik. So that, I think, is a really important element to understand that this rediscovery of the white movement is not, didn't begin, in fact, during Perestroika or, or at the collapse of the Soviet Union. It was already there during uh, the 70s and the 80s, especially through, through movies. Then we have a chapter that discussed the kind of ambiguous status of the white in today's Russia, where their judicial rehabilitation are mostly failed. And I will be happy after during the Q&A if, if there are any discussion on that to explain why, for example, the Nikin has been rehabilitated, but not Kolchak. And they are very clear legal, logical argument that the Russian regime is using to decide who can be rehabilitated, rehabilitated, who cannot. But even if this judicial rehabilitation largely failed, there have been a successful cultural rehabilitation of the white movement and globally of the uh, immigration uh, time into kind of reintegrating the Russian cultural uh, uh, pantheon now. Then we have a chapter that is looking more specifically at the role not only of the Russian Orthodox Church, but of different Orthodox groups around the church and the growing cult around uh, uh, Nicholas II. He was already a popular figure just at the collapse of the Soviet Union. It has been once again very popular uh, uh, more recently around the, the 100th anniversary of the, the Bolshevik Revolution and the, the, the killing of the imperial family. And then the last chapter is looking at what we call the state agnostic position, where we discuss the way the Russian regime is trying to find a quite difficult or sensitive balance between a red and a, and a white uh, uh, narrative. Very briefly, some element that we found really uh, fascinating is how much through these windows of looking at the memory of the civil war, we see how much Russia has a plurality of memories. Maybe not on the Second World War, but on everything else, clearly it has, and on the civil war, it's very visible. The public opinion, it's really interesting, is both indifferent and divided. Uh, uh, surveys done by uh, Tsum and Levada show that more or less one third of the public opinion doesn't care about the civil war, it's too far away. One third care and consider that both sides were right in their own, with their own legitimacy, which means that you only have one third of the population that can identify with either the red or the white uh, uh, narrative. And interest, in, interestingly enough, so the older generation identified more with the red narrative. The younger generation are quite divided equally between those who would identify as red and those who would identify as white. But as I said, it's only a very one third of the population that would make a choice between red and white. At the elite level, the cultural and the political elite, we can identify very clearly groups that would promote a red or white narrative of course, the red narrative is very visible around the Communist Party and the groups that are still sharing uh, this kind of very positive vision of the Soviet Union. The white narrative is uh, mostly advanced by uh, some groups of Russian nationalists and by this kind of huge realm of orthodox, not only the church, but different orthodox groups. What we found also fascinating, and that's where really Margarita has been uh, working a lot, is the, the importance of regional diversity, right? Depending on who are the regional administration, on which kind of groups they are pressuring the regional administration, you can really identify regions that are pushing for a red narrative, regions that have a white 
uh, uh, narrative or region that don't want to have to make a choice because both narratives have their own defenses. That's the case, for example, in the Kuban region, where because of the Cossack movement, you have a strong white narrative, but the red one is still there. So you really don't have any kind of federal, you have the federal level narrative, but then they are really kind of regional uh, 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 diversity and kind of uh, uh, in, almost individual uh, vision of this combination of red and white. And then my last slide, just to discuss a little bit more what is the state uh, uh, position that we found really interesting. So there are two ways of looking at the state position. One is to say that it's neither red nor white, right? Because if you look at the way the, the regimes has been dif difficulties in managing the, the anniversary of the Bolshevik revolution, trying to avoid having to take a stance on one side or the other, the, the strategy of the regime is to recognize plurality of memories, so they are all welcome, but there is a hierarchy, right? So the whites are legitimate as long as they can find a small room inside a narrative of the 20th century that is still mostly Soviet-centered. And I will come back on that aspect. Or you can interpret this uh, agnostic position as its fact being more red than white for several reasons. First, of course, institutional inertia of uh, bureaucratic institution make that the Soviet narrative is still the, the predominant one. And also because the regime is in charge of reconquering its great uh, power statue, then of course the Soviet narrative seems the most obvious and it's also the one that resonates the most with the, the society and, and the nostalgia. So the red narrative in a sense is very legitimate but not the Bolshevik time, right? It's, it's late Soviet Union that is legitimate more than the, the first year of the Bolshevik regime. At the same time, because the Russian regime is interested in kind of anchoring Russia in Europe, you really can see strategies of reintegrating, as I said at the beginning, this inter memory of the uh, uh, Russian immigration in Europe as part of Russian cultural uh, uh, pantheon, and that contributes to reintegrating part of the white uh, uh, narrative. And then you have people that you can identify as really promoting very strongly a white narrative inside the circle of the elites. You have film director Nikita Mikhalkov, who is very famous, but you also have uh, uh, some uh, orthodox businessmen, Konstantin Malofeyev, Vladimir Yakunin, and a lot of people around them who have been really pushing for both the state and the church to take a very clear kind of pro-white uh, uh, stance. Uh, when we try to look more at what we can imagine is put in vision uh, uh, of the of the, the this kind of red and white what i we found really interesting is that in fact the whites are rehabilitated and i seen as kind of glamorous figure during the civil war because the bolsheviks are, are considered as dangerous revolutionary at that time but once the soviet union is institutionalized and became a, a strong russian state then the white got decredibilized, right? So the white are positive during the civil war, the white are less positive during immigration because they continue to fight not only against Bolshevik, but against a stabilized, strong Soviet state, right? So what is really key here, depending what is the state of the Russian, the Soviet state, if it's a weak one or a strong one, then it changed the way the whites can be rehabilitated as symbol of Russian history or as fighting wrongly against the Soviet st state. And last point that we make at the end of the book is that, of course, the, 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 the current strategy of saying that everything, the current state narrative about the danger of any kind of street uh, uh, color revolution and the fact that every revolution is seen as a danger, of course, push indirectly to favor a pro tsarist vision. And we see it, we have seen it recently on the way uh, the, the, some, the historical Russia, my history has been displayed on several new movies that really show uh, every kind of revolutionary movement of the 19th century as very negative because they are challenging uh, 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 the Russian state. So this kind of very conservative counter-revolutionary uh, 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 policy strategies of uh, the Putin's regime tend to, in fact, favor uh, 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 sometimes a more pro-Tsarist vision than, than a, a, a pro-Soviet one if it means rehabilitating a kind of uh, uh, all the leftist uh, uh, trend that uh, uh, give birth later to the, the Bolshevik revolution. 
I will stop here. It was a very general overview and, and Margarita and I are really looking forward to, to the discussion. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Marlene. Then the next speaker is going to be Margarita, right? For both of us. Oh, okay. I, I, I misunderstood that. Okay, well, then the Sorry. next speaker is going to be Eric Lohr. So, uh, Eric, the floor is yours. Well, thanks so much. And uh, wow, what a treat to read this book. It uh, It is really, uh, I think, overly modest in its title. It's really not just about the Civil War. It's It's really about the memory of Imperial and Soviet Russia in a larger sense. And uh, I think it would be great for uh, classroom use, not least because of its small size. This this series of uh, Russian shorts is a great idea. I think all of us who teach always face this dilemma. We'd like to assign books, but if you're only going to assign for one week, anything over 100 pages is really difficult to do. So thanks for being concise. And I also would say that for this series, which I'm very excited about and hope to contribute to myself, I think this can serve as something of a model. Uh, you present in this book new research on specific aspects of the topic, but you always spread it, you always draw the, extrapolate from the, the specific out to more general points about memory and a very large topic. So I think it's, a, it's an exciting book in that sense. Um, one of the things that it does that you would really have to read it to get a sense for is that it captures very well the, the really great and incompatible variety of contemporary views on the whites. Um, it's a really colorful cast of characters that uh, Marlene and Margarita delve into uh, supporting various white memory initiatives. There, are, um, there, there was a boat full of emigres from Russia that recreated the exit from Crimea, went in reverse, came to Russia. There's um, this young oligarch Malofeyev uh, who has an idea of Putin as czar. There's various monarchist movements, um, the, the churches involved. Um, all of this colorful detail really helps you to understand the diversity of what white means. I mean, I think the Bolsheviks tried very hard throughout the 20th century to paint the whites as uniformly reactionary and all of one type. And this book very much breaks down all of the various uh, aspects of what white memory is. And I think the conclusion that at least I took away is that there's, there's really not a single usable conservative white uh, past, even amongst those who are conservatively inclined, they're really quite divided amongst each other as to what it all means. Um, and in that regard, I'd like to ask a, a question about whether, um, uh, where you see the idea of a usable liberal white past. And it, it wasn't a big theme in the book, but certainly in the academic sphere in the 90s, it was a very predominant preoccupation to try to discover uh, a, a liberal version of the white uh, memory and past that lived on in the emigration and, and could be re rediscovered. Um, and certainly, um, you know, the Bolsheviks tried to paint the whites as all reactionary, but if you just look at the government of Denikin, it had Struve and Milyakov, and uh, the Trubetskoy brothers were involved. I'm, I'm writing about the Trubetskoy, so I'm very passionate about the idea of liberal, uh, liberal whites and uh, their role in uh, memory of what the whites were all about, what, what exile meant, too. Exile was not just a bunch of reactionaries. Um, and in the in the um, section on the church too, there's a, a real strong focus on the uh, ROKOR, the Russian Orthodox Church outside Russia, which is the very reactionary wing of the emigre church. But many white emigres were not in ROKOR. They were in the Orthodox Church of America or other liberal movements. There's um, uh, theologians like Alexander Schmemann, uh, who is affiliated with, who was the head of the seminary of the OCA, of the Orthodox Church of America in um, New York, um, uh, his writings have been very popular in Russia, um, and he has proponents and protectors within the church establishment as well. So uh, I, I don't know, you know, what you all think about liberal white memory and what it's possible, what it, how it exists now, and what its possibilities might be for the future. Um, I also really appreciated uh, the uh, comment that at one point in the book that. Uh, in many instances, maybe uh, it wasn't, the memories are not political, maybe it was just nostalgic, that it's kind of akin to the, the Belle Epoque kind of nostalgia for, you know, turn of the century uh, Europe before all of the horrors of 1914 to 1945. And um, I was wondering what you think in that regard uh, about uh, Project 1917, if you're familiar with it, it was a sort of online equivalent of Facebook that ran every day exactly 100 years later. 
Um, I, I was addicted to it and and watched it, read it every day. But um, the nostalgia there didn't really pick sides. I mean, there was nostalgia for the revolutionaries, nostalgia for the whites, for the old regime, for the elites, for everything in a sense. And uh, just wondering what you might say about that. Um, uh, I, I'd like to also now just turn quickly to uh, the really excellent chapter on the state search for reconciliation. Uh, if there's one thing to take away from this book, I think it's that uh, the state is and has been quite uncomfortable in trying being forced to choose between reds and whites or even different versions of red versus white nostalgia and memory and has tried to you know pursue a big tent kind of uh, memory operation. Uh, that said, I mean, it's it's clear that there's a trend towards whites away from reds. And I think one of the, the, the concrete examples of that that was really vivid is that while Lenin remains on Red Square, there's there's no really serious uh, move to remove him. But during Putin's era, uh, about a thousand Lenin statues have been quietly taken down. And so there there is there is a sort of secular, arguable secular shift underway. Um, but uh, anyway, this this uh, idea of trying to avoid picking sides in all these disputes really uh, came to a head in the 2017 centenary of the uh, revolutions of 1917. And um, I think you describe it as a real headache <laughs> in the book, which is, a, I think, a great term. Um, but uh, in, in essence, uh, I mean, I went to one of the big academic conferences in Moscow and the deputy minister of culture uh, started the conference, a four-day conference with thousands of people there, uh, with a keynote address in which she basically said, well, the Soviet Union, you know, collectivization and industrialization, that was all very violent and unfortunate. But, you know, I guess maybe it did help the Soviet Union to win World War II, and therefore we have to respect it. Uh, but the one lesson we need to take away from 1917 is that we should never, ever, in Russia, ever have a revolution again. <laughs> and I think you captured that kind of essence that um, the things that are salvageable about the red, the red vision and the red remembrance are the things that promoted the great power of the state, uh, the military capacity of the state, and generally the state in, um, in, in a long durée history of the Russian state that goes back even further all the, through the thousand years of Russian history and et cetera. Um, so uh, I was kind of struck that um, in a sense, I mean, if, if we look at our time in America right now, um, the Civil War is still very alive and very passionate. I mean, we are having disputes over bringing down statues, and um, we have the South voting as a bloc with racism of central issue. It seems in comparison that the civ Russian Civil War, which was much more recent and had nearly as many victims, if not more, as a percent of population, um, is not as uh, passionately disputed. and. You open today by saying only a third of the population even really has a, an opinion. And of those third, I mean, I don't know how many have a really passionate opinion. Um, so in some sense, maybe, um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I published an article recently. I, I meant it to be pr provocative. I titled it, The Bolshevik Revolution is Over. Um, but it was published in September, and I haven't heard much back. So maybe maybe it wasn't that provocative. Maybe, maybe it is kind of over. And um, uh, those kind of issues uh, are um, are not front and center in Russian society or or American, uh, or maybe it's just so uh, uncomfortable that nobody really wants to touch it or engage. That might that's the other possible interpretation. So I, I think I have about a minute left. So I I just would like to uh, throw out a couple smaller questions. Well, maybe not so small. One of them is uh, I I was a little bit still uncertain as to what the legal and practical ramifications of amnesty and rehabilitation were um, and why the regime is so reluctant to uh, grant it. I don't know what the stakes are. Why, why is there such resistance to it? Is it, is it simply a sense of um, uh, respecting the question of Soviet justice as, as per recognizing the validity of uh, the legal and justice systems of regimes across time and in in, maybe in the sense that there might be a post-Putin regime in which 
there should be no questions about any uh, legal decisions that were made during the Putin era? I don't know, but I, I would be interested in what your your uh, thoughts are on that. Um, and I'll just end there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Maybe the resonance would have been greater had the article been called the Bolshevik Revolution is not over, right? So that they could have caused a bit of reaction. Anyway, thank you so much. So we'll collect these questions and then uh, we'll discuss them after the fourth speaker uh, has ended. Um, and Nina Tomarkin, you're the next. Um, th thank you. So uh, I just want to see my see the grid here. Yes. OK, so of course we have yet another Laura Well triumph. Um, and congratulations also to um, her co-author, your co-author, Margarita Karnasheva. Um, an absolutely fascinating book. And I, of course, I was struck just the way Eric was by two things. First of all, I guess the cast of colorful characters is that you referred to. I mean, just fascinating people I never would have um, heard of. I think I think Richard Stites, um, actually, the late Richard Stites of Georgetown University was could have rivaled you in terms of colorful characters that he would bring up um, in his wonderful books um, on, on Soviet and Russian culture. Um, and um, also the contrast that I really point out to my students, um, and this is just a perfect timing for a book on memory politics uh, for an American audience at a time when there is this driving, driving movement to look upon the American past with shame um, and sort of look at all the negative aspects of it. Um, and here, um, sort of the more the Russian approach is to look to the past for inspiration, um, with look for pride, especially the great patriotic war, but but somewhat jealous. I mean, it really is just an extraordinary, an extraordinary uh, contrast. Um, I should say that um, in, I particularly enjoyed reading this book. Some of the material gets very personal because I myself come from a family of double emigres, um, emigrating from the Russian Empire um, shortly after the Russian Revolution um, and to the capital cities of Europe. Um, and then at the beginning of World War II, um, emigrating to the United States. Um, and my family were supporters um, mostly of the right socialist revolutionaries. Um, indeed, my cousin by marriage was Nikolai of Ktsensev, who was um, a, a social, one of the founders of the Socialist Revolutionary Party and a minister in the provisional government. The family was very, very enthusiastic about the February Revolution, and I grew up um, in emigre circles um, in New York. Um, uh, so, uh, I, I'd say there are three main points that I want to make, um, and I guess my my status as a child of emigres um, will, will drive the first one. Um, it's <laughs> sort of the big question of what do you mean by whites, um, right? Because sometimes you say whites and, you know, normally one thinks the people who fought against the Bolsheviks in the Civil War or the people who supported those who fought, fought with Bolsheviks um, in the Civil War. But then this is the most, this is extremely broadly construed um, because then you also talk of nostalgia for the Russian nobility, for its rich cultural life, for the, um, you know, rec uh, reclaiming again um, the great cultural figures of, of Russia's past. Um, so, and I'd like to focus on that part because I think um, I'm not sure, frankly, that I would call all of that white. That's that's like stretching the term, I think, a great deal since, well, for obvious reasons, not everybody were people who looked with nostalgia um, upon upon the whites, although the white forces themselves, of course, were so mixed and so much pluralism there. Um, yes, beginning um, in the late Soviet period, um, you have uh, battle reenactors. I actually, in my own work, have been studying battle reenactors and primarily, particularly since they were not allowed to, there was during the Soviet period, you were not allowed to have battle reenactors to reenact anything to do with the great patriotic war. Um, I mean, overwhelmingly, this was, these were the 1812 people. Um, and still, I think probably um, the largest number of groups of battle reenactors are the Napoleonic Wars. Um, 
And they really, many of them want to recreate the culture. I actually befriended some of them. There's a group called Grenadier, my friends in Moscow. Um, and um, the ladies there told me that they actually have balls um, trying to be based on, you know, the ball in War and Peace, um, Nat Natasha Rostova's first ball. And they sew their ball dresses, ball gowns, and and so on. Um, uh, I think uh, it was very striking to me, um, I remember, it was only 20 years ago, how Putin, at the very beginning of his presidency, was attempting to bring back the great emigre figures from the diaspora, uh, sort of reintegrating that um, that um, those emigration, a kind of reclaiming of dead souls. Um, you, um, the book begins with um, the reburial of Denikin, um, and um, so I'll take me take me back to um, November first, two thousand, um, in which on that day, amid rain and gusty winds, Vladimir Putin paid a visit to the municipal cemetery in saint Geneviève de bois a little town uh, south of Paris where so many Russian emigres are buried. Um, now, that happened to be November 1st, All Saints Day, um, in the Catholic Church calendar, and that was probably coincidental to his visit, but nonetheless, it was very fitting um, because it's the world's largest Russian cemetery outside of Russia. They repose the remains of some 10,000 Russian emigres, including uh, uh, the, the famous ballet dancer uh, Rudolf Nureyev uh, and so many others. And the president placed bouquets on of the classic Soviet era funerary red carnations. Remember, they, everybody did only red carnations on some of these graves, including that of the Nobel Prize winning writer Ivan Bunin. And Putin said, and I quote, Many countries in the world have known tragedies and overcome them. I think it is now time for us also to reunite. We must all remember uh, that we are the children of the same mother whose name is Russia. So there was an attempt to kind of bring them back. And in fact, there was a little bit of a scandal um, that um, also in 2000, um, Russian authorities were, uh, made an attempt to um, exhumed the remains of the great uh, ballet dancer Anna, Pav Pavlo uh, Anna Pavlova um, and have those taken back to Russia. She had been um, buried in London since her death in 1931, and there were plans um, that her ashes would be transferred to Moscow and interred in the Novodevichy Cemetery. Um, and in the end, um, Pavlova's um, uh, family, or is it Anna Pavlova? Pavlova, is it? Pavlova, I guess, right? Um, her family protested the plan. It was uh, the plan. Oh, it was the brainchild of our old friend Moscow Mayor Lushkov, um, actually. And there were serious uh, tensions between Lushkov and the St. Petersburg Ballet com community. Um, in the end, the ashes stayed in London. Um, but um, but I, in, in, when you think, consider queries, I'd like to uh, ask you more about the role of diaspora emigres and. Um, you talked about the uh, um, reclaiming the interwar emigres, but what about uh, other emigres, such as, I have no idea what they have to say about Nabokov, you know, for example, um, so many who were not strictly speaking um, from the interwar period. Um, I'd like to then, my second point has to do with reading about the, ch the church. My, my favorite chapter actually was about the Russian Orthodox Church and reading about um, the plurality um, of views and movements and groups in the church. Now, Marlene Laurel has this pattern. I mean, she has this goal of taking major aspects of Russia and Russian institutions that everyone thinks is monolithic and then showing how there, there's actually a great deal of plurality. So she had this famous um, article that I always assign uh, um, to my students in my very popular Vladimir Putin um, freshman seminar um, about the ecosystems in the Kremlin. You know, everybody thinks it's monolithic. Actually, there are these ecosystems and there's this group and the nostalgic group and the white group and the military industrial complex and so on. And now she's been doing, now she's doing it with the church. You know, it seems, you know, much more monolithic, but there's so many groups and streams and 
um, it's fascinating. And it just, to me, it seems such a change, really. Of course, you've re- first of all, you've published about it before, and I've read, read it, I think I've re- read everything that you've that you published, except on Central Asia, which I'm less interested in. Um, but right now, I'm I'm teaching um, I'm teaching medieval Russia, um, and so here's uh, medieval Russia's epics, chronicles, and tales. Um, one of the books that that I assign um, in the class, and uh, I, I don't assign this uh, article, but there was a very famous article by Father George Florovsky uh, called "The Problem of Old Russian Culture," in which he talked about. Uh, he talked as it said that the problem with old Russian culture was that it had adopt Russia Rus had adopted Christianity too late after uh, all the heresies and schisms and so on in the Russian Orthodox Church had been resolved. There had been so many in the Byzantine Church, but they had been earlier. So 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 Rus inherited a, a Christianity that was too perfect. Um, and immutable, and the spirit of debate and factionalism had already gone. And so, it, in a way, it sort of crippled Russia because it had been um, too perfect. So, I mean, so it, it's kind of interesting to think about that kind of contrast. Also, just quickly, I, I have just a, a couple of more minutes, um, that uh, the, uh, the, the, the interest in the cult of Nicholas II, um, and particularly the religious aspects of Nicholas II, uh, he's presented, and the way you write about it, just like the first saints who were canonized in Russia, uh, Boris and Gleb, who had been murdered by their in, uh, murdered by their brother um, uh, after the in 1015 after the death um, of Vladimir by their brother evil brother um, Yarapok, um, and they were sanctified, but not because they d- had died for Christ but because they had died like Christ, meekly accepting their deaths without resistance um, and passion sufferers. And so Nicholas II and his family are also viewed as passion sufferers who were like Christ in that they accepted their death without resistance. Of course, what kind of resistance they could have made, um, I don't know. My la- I just have a couple of moments I have, I think, right. My last point is about uh, about uh, Lenin. I'm so uh, about so glad that Margarita is in Ulan Ude. I did write this book on the Lenin cult, and of course, I have a photograph of myself with this enormous, the most enormous head of Lenin um, in the world. And then my last point about it is that um, the first thing that struck me um, when I read about the constitutional reform um, vote at the end of uh, June, the beginning of July of this year was that it was really too bad because I was looking forward to 2024, um, which was to be the the end of uh, Putin's presidential term, also the 100th anniversary of the death of Lenin. So I had decided um, in advance that in 2024, two Vladimir's would be kicked out of the Kremlin at the same time, leaving only the third, the statue of the saint. Um, But that might not happen now. Thank you very much. (laughs) <laughs> Thank you so much, Nina, and also for that prediction. Our next speaker is Alexander Virchowski. The floor is yours, Alexander. Okay, that works. Um, I won't add any more. What's happening? Do you hear me? Something's wrong. Uh, I won't add any more compliments. Uh, there were many said, and they won't. It, it's very, it was very interesting to read this book. Uh, and I would also uh, uh, ask the question about this liberal white tradition. Where is it? Uh, does it still exist? What, for example, is really lost is, I mean, in general public, is a tradition of uh, socialist anti Bolsheviks almost forgotten. Historians remember, but general public doesn't care. Uh, but I, I would make two points, one about the church and another about nationalist movement. Mm, about the church, uh, the white monarchism in the church uh, since 90s was uh, very close to 
religious fundamentalism uh, inside the church. All these rather weird ideas about uh, searching for satanic signs in the barcodes or in passports or wherever. Uh, and it was strong enough in the beginning of, the very beginning of the century. And as you wrote, the bishop at that time, Bishop uh, Tichon, was uh, one of key figures of this movement at that moment. And then he switched his position. Interestingly for me, it reminds the behavior of many white officers who turned to rights, to whites, uh, uh, sorry, uh, white officers who turned to, to, on, to the red side for the sake of the rush of Russia, for the idea of loyalty to authorities. Uh, in this case, it's loyalty more to spiritual authorities, but also to secular authorities, in fact. Uh, and uh, uh, generally speaking about uh, the distribution between more or less white and more or less red uh, trends uh, in the church, we see that there is a combination. Uh, and because the main position of the church leadership is to oppose uh, secular and Western liberal trends, and here they need all allies which they can get, including uh, Reds, of course. Uh, so, uh, in this situation, if we look at the this Semirne uh, Ruskin Narodny Sabor World Russian National Council with political wing of the Church, uh, it's also a combination of white and red elements. But whites, more or less whites, are dominating, and now they are dominating more visibly since uh, Konstantin Malafeev became, became really head of this political wing. Uh, then, uh, talking about nationalists as a movement, not, not as a writers, but as a political movement, uh, monarchists uh, were much more visible in this movement in the 90s than they are visible now. But, uh, strangely enough for me, from the beginning of the war in Don on Donbass, uh, they returned, partly at least. Uh, Strelkov is monarchist, uh, Lafayev, of course, is monarchist. And even only one Russian nationalist group, which is known in the United States, uh, Russian imperial movement, uh, because it's uh, enlisted as terrorist one, is also a monarchist group. Uh, why is it happening? We can just speculate. Uh, maybe I will skip this part. But and uh, if we look at this pro Novorossiya part of Russian nationalists, because there are pro Novorossiya nationalists and anti Novorossiya nationalists, in this pro Novorossiya uh, part, we see the revival of uh, white, uh, white and red alliance, uh, like in nineties when it was more called uh, red and brown, but it's more or less about the same, uh, about conservative pro-revolution ideas and conservative Stalinist ideas. And this alliance uh, is now even stronger than any other groups in uh, nationalist movement. Uh, of course, in, in this alliance, I would say that uh, more red elements are stronger than white elements. Uh, but white elements cannot avoid it because uh, it, just because they are weaker and if they leave, uh, they will lose politically. But if we look uh, on other groups, uh, I would say that uh, it's visible uh, among nationalists, it's very visible that you can be uh, a big fan of uh, whites, but not to be uh, a monarchist at all. Uh, it's most obvious for neo-Nazi groups. Uh, they are naturally anti-communists uh, and they write a lot in, in social networks, in wherever they can, about white heroes, uh, white heroes during civil, civil war or white heroes, today's white, white heroes we, by which they mean uh, people who commit hate crimes. Uh, for example, I don't know, we had an organization, um, National, so National Socialist Society, 
the title is obvious enough. Its leader, uh, Dmitry Romyansev, uh, he left politics when the society was uh, destroyed by security services, but he continues uh, his activity in social networks propagating uh, white heroes of uh, civil war. And it can be said about uh, groups of neo-Nazi who continue to be active, like Black Bloc, for example, or some others. Uh, and this attitude is also visible among uh, nationalists who were, let's say, former neo-Nazi and became more moderate and pro-Kremlin. Uh, we saw them in a right conservative alliance uh, in the beginning of this decade, uh, in the middle of the decade. Uh, they also propagate whites a lot. Even uh, national Democrats uh, do that uh, rather regularly. Uh, we, for example, have a publishing house, Black Hundreds, with a, such a title. It's not a monarchist a publishing house, but National Democrat group. Uh, and they publish a lot of books about whites. Uh, so uh, it's popular enough, but uh, at the same time, uh, we, we have to understand that the whole Russian nationalist movement is not only on the decline, it's already almost non-existent for the moment. I mean, not the Russian nationalist as a phenomenon, but the political movement. Uh, and I believe it will revive sooner or later, but uh, it will revive on some new basis, which we cannot predict now. We, uh, maybe ideas will be more or less the same, but the combination of ideas may be completely different from anything we saw before. Uh, and if the combination is different, we don't know what proportion of white and red uh, will be used. Uh, will it happen during the current political regime or, or at the moment when regime changes? Uh, we don't know. And a couple of more words. Uh, you write in the conclusion uh, uh, very correctly that uh, our authorities, they slowly turn to the, to the red side of the general Russian legacy for, because it's more useful, let's say. Uh, while, yes, they try to, to use both from the very beginning of Putin's rule. Uh, but it's not only because of pragmatic things, but I think it's also a kind of populist thing because general public, uh, I'm not sure what general public thinks. You're right, only one third of people have uh, some opinion, but uh, our authorities place the card of conservatism. They appeal to conservative political attitudes among population. And by conservatism, they do not mean any conservative theory. They mean uh, conservative, conservatism as a feeling. And this feeling, uh, not among writers, but among, let's say, average citizens, uh, is oriented to the real life experience, which goes not far than uh, late Soviet period. Uh, so our conservatism is more addressed to Brezhnev's years than to any others. And it's related even to Russian Orthodox Church. Uh, it's, it's not only my opinion, many people wrote about that. It's, it's something uh, natural for today's Russia and authorities use it because it's easier. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alexander Verkhovsky. And our fourth and final speaker is Boris Kolonitsky. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you so much for inviting me for this discussion. It was a real pleasure uh, to read this book. It was very useful and I quote it in my own research right now. And uh, I'll assign it definitely to my students so they'll be forced to read your books, uh, Marlene and Margarita. Um, what is yours? Uh, poor, poor, poor kids, but, but they must do, do, do this reading. Ex uh, they must do this extra reading, I would say. Yeah. Uh, um, what should I say? Mm, uh, of course, uh, there was no place, there was no enough space 
to write about everything in this book and it was your task to, to, to it was your task to uh, write a, a rather small book which, which is a good site of this text uh, i would i would like to to say some words about uh, scholars in this project uh, there is no much um, attention devoted to scholars to contemporary russian scholars but scholars sometimes are maybe not important but relevant mm. we can imagine memory project without any scholar without any academic uh, support without any academic legitimization but uh, sometimes that could create a problem uh, and the very uh, prehistoric time showed us how dangerous it is to have so-called white holes or, or, or black holes or white spots or how, how you call it, uh, because academicians could say, uh, uh, come say, and using their academic authority say, it, it's, it's just not, not right. And I, I, I think, and uh, I, I've confirmed um, my impression after reading your book that uh, the Soviet discourse is still very powerful in spite of the fact of personal views and judges of different memory actors. What I mean, what I mean, uh, I mean that uh, there is, there are some facts about history of the uh, Soviet, uh, of the Russian Civil War, and there are some interpretations uh, most important interpretation, most interesting interpretations of the civil war, which exist now among scholars. Uh, what is, I would say, maybe consensus about Russian civil war? That this civil war was very extremely complicated. Some scholars even speak about different Russian civil wars, actually not just Russian civil wars, which existed at the same time overlapping. Scholars say that civil wars were absolutely different in different parts of the country. What was about Soviet interpretation of the history of civil war? It was simplification. It was the his history of the Reds fighting against the Whites. So actually, initially, the Bolsheviks imposed the very level the Whites Initially, it was not self-definition, a self-identification for, the, for, for uh, the, the whites. And some of them didn't want to do it, didn't want to, to get this level of the white guards until immigration time. Of course, the Bolsheviks were interested to have this um, polar view of the civil war because they, uh, they, they ignored other parts of the war uh, like moderate socialists, Nina told us uh, something about some of them, and some other groups, different national and religious groups, including which were very powerful in some parts of the uh, country at the time of the Civil War, in some periods uh, of the Civil War. And later, the whites also, they were very much interesting in this white red interpretation of the civil war, ignoring all other sides too, which historically it's 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 just just wrong. What was the second um, discourse of victory of the Bolsheviks? Uh, they uh, depicted all white movement as a monarchist movement, and actually this this uh, the uh, this description of the civil war still exists, and this we read by different people and institutions who have uh, absolutely different ideas about the civil war. So it's from for for contemporary left wing, for contemporary right wing, for contemporary uh, monarchist, for contemporary neo Bolsheviks, or who, it is just the same: Reds against the Whites, and Whites is about monarchy. Historically, that's, that's wrong, but it is picked up by different forces. That's why I'm, I'm saying that the Soviet simplification of history still exists, and it's it used uh, by different opposing uh, memorial actors. Memorial actors. Um, uh, I would say also 
uh, there is one also important issue behind uh, this scene, uh, which is public opinion. So we speak mostly about memorial activists, small and active groups which travel loudly. But what about their audience? What about so-called uh, small men or small women uh, who are are targeted by this uh, propaganda. Uh, according to public opinion polls, uh, the Russians have very strong opinion about the Bolshevik Revolution and uh, the Civil War. Well, there are different results, but uh, to according to some of them, that 40-something uh, Russian citizens still think that October Revolution was a good thing or even very good thing, and 30 something, um, the figure is close, think that it was bad or extremely bad thing. So public opinion is rather split in, in this, but there are no much conflicts uh, about it. Why? It's not about strong emotion. People think that they remember Russian civil war, but um, their emotions are somewhere else as far as history is concerned. Uh, and it is proved by interviews uh, I got, um, some scholars remarked it, uh, people are more in different sides of the Second World War. People are much more interested in repressions and terror of Stalin about the 30s. That are hot issues. So they, they have strong opinions about revolution and, and the civil war, but there is no much much um, much emotion behind it, which influences different mm, messages of different memorial actors, uh, which 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 act now and are described in this book. Thank you. Thank you very much, Boris Kronlitsky. And uh, now I want to turn the floor to the two authors. It seems to me from the four panelists that one question was touched upon by all four speakers, and that's the differentiation among different uh, groups of whites. And what does this definition of whites really encompass? Is it a big tent, as Eric Lohr put it, or is it um, something that um, you know deserves uh, more uh, differentiation, or let's say a re-diversification uh, in, uh, in the scholarly uh, discourse? Uh, uh, Malen or Margarita, who wants to take that, that question? Oh, we were discussing uh, <laughs> if we can um, define them as whites. And you, you do you remember? I, I've told you that uh, there are different versions of why um, they are called whites. And one was uh, very um uh, eccentric i would say that uh it was trotsky's Le leon trotsky's invention because he wanted to present um uh, their the red's opponents as uh, royalists as monarchists because uh, uh the bolsheviks uh, were looking for support and uh uh, international socialist movement and there were also socialists um, like Nikolai Ksentiev uh, who um, joined the anti-Bolshevik anti movement so they basically were competed for the international support and that's why um, the Bolsheviks uh, they um, decided to present their opponents as monarchists to to strip them of uh, the um, leftist support abroad and there are other versions but definitely i agree that uh, this uh, the whites was not the name uh, their uh, leaders of the movement uh, wanted for themselves, actually. And uh, um, 
uh, there were two stages of the civil war. On the first stage, when the when Dinikin, Kolchak, and other federalists mm -hmm. or republicans, they were not monarchists. Uh, in fact, they uh, uh, but they supported the provisional government, uh, Kerensky, and uh, because uh, it. They started the movement, the anti-Bolshevik movement, because they wanted to overthrow Bolsheviks, who uh, took uh, the power from provisional government, and uh, most of them were actually members of provisional government, like Viktor Chernov, who was a socialist revolutionary, and um, uh, then. Uh, the monarchists joined them because uh, the monarchist idea was very popular among the military. And uh, the Federalists, they needed the military to fight the, Bolshevik, uh, the Bolsheviks. And then they split it because they could not uh, agree on the future. Uh, I mean, which, who will who will rule Russia if the Bolsheviks uh, will be defeated? Would be defeated, and uh, those monarchies they were whites in the sense uh, in the sense uh, Trotsky wanted them to be. They were white monarchists, royalists, basically, and so uh, I don't remember how finally we decided to stick to the definition, the white definition. <laughs> Do you remember? Oh, I can. Marlene, hear we you. cannot hear you. Marlene, we cannot hear you. No. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I have an issue with that. Yeah, yeah, I would say it's all my fault because each time when I changed the chapter, Margarita was criticizing me. <laughs> criticizing me on, on, on not using the term white in a, in a too precise sense and being too broad. So, so you can see the difference between the real historian <laughs> and the person working on contemporary issues and trying to look at history. But yeah, I think that's one of the issues of the book is to have this broader to broad definition of the white. And then the second point that many of you uh, mentioned about the, the, the fact that we didn't really discuss the liberal uh, use of the, of the white past. And I think it was really very visible in the early 90s to have this kind of liberal reading of the white movement. Now, my impression is that it disappeared because it's, you see the problem of the liberal movement in reference to, to the civil war is that it's a moment of a very weak state and everything in Russia is so much about the legitimacy of the strong state that to be legitimate when you speak to the Russian public opinion, either you celebrate a strong state before the revolution or a strong state after the revolution, but to celebrate a weak Russian state between February and October, <laughs> is almost impossible to sell as a political project, right? You can sell liberalism as an idea, a political philosophy, but as what happened during these six months is, I think, very difficult to, it's not a very usable uh, past. And so I think that the, the liberal in Russia today tend to insist maybe on people who wrote the liberals who were in immigration as kind of political philosopher, but referring specifically, you know, to Kerensky or to the, the, the government for these few months, I think is, is a very difficult uh, selling point. And uh, maybe another uh, comment also I would like to, to answer to Eric when you were mentioning why the, the Russian state today is so resistant toward amnesty and rehabilitation. My impression, and, and maybe Margareta will add on that, is that, yeah, rehabilitating would mean 
saying that Soviet judgment were wrong or false, as those done against, for example, Kolchak, but it's just the global idea that the more you are, the more the Russian state would challenge the Soviet legal system today, given the memory war with Poland, the Baltic state, Ukraine, and globally Central Europe, the more that would potentially open the door for challenging the legitimacy of the Soviet regime. And then that would bring all the discussion about the Second World War, the, the, the ribbentrop molotov pact, the issues of, you know, like paying back the occupied territory. So it's just almost impossible in the current political context to begin to open what looks like a Pandora box of beginning saying, OK, the Soviet regime made mistake in judging this and that person. And then, and then it would immediately or very rapidly uh, move to the Second World War. And that would challenge Russia's strategy of, of uh, memory around the Second World War. So that's why I think they are very, very careful in trying to rehabilitate at minima. Uh, and my, my vision of uh, the issue of legal re rehabilitation for the white movement uh, is uh, that uh, it was not granted to those white movement participants who during uh, World War II fought on the side of Axis powers. And this is like uh, bottom line. <laughs> the, the, this uh, um, white movement participants can be rehabilitated because they were war criminals and it's true. Many of them were war criminals, like, uh, for instance, um, Kozak, uh, Atamans, Piotr Krasnov, and uh, Andrzej Kuro, they, um, uh, well, it's, we, do, <laughs> we don't have enough time to talk about this, but they uh, did commit uh, war crimes and crimes against humanity and in this sense, uh, the Soviet military tribunals were right, and uh, no matter of how totalitarian the Soviet state was, this is war crimes and war criminals. So um, that's why the main prosecutor's officer has turned down numerous appeals for rehabilitation of uh, uh, this pro access whites and uh, well, uh, also uh, Alexander Kalchak uh, was not granted rehabilitation because he was uh, acknowledged as a war criminal. So, this is my vision of the issue. Though, uh, the a point that uh, um, Contemporary Russian uh, state does not want to to uh, reject uh, Soviet judicial system completely, even though the uh, in the even in the 1960s when basically the legal rehabilitation began. Uh, uh, the, the, the um, illegality of a Soviet judicial system was recognized partly. So this is. May I follow up here just with a question uh, on my own? So does, it seems to me that from a legal point of view, there has been an inconsistency in regards to the white movement. If we if we use this broad uh, definition, let's say um, a famous case is General Skipsov, who who you know was actually a butcher and uh, and uh, was known to be, but then he was accepted as a teacher uh, for the Soviet um, military academy before a listener, uh, you know, shot him right in the right in the uh, auditorium. I think it was in 1926 or so. And uh, and you have this ambiguity, you know, in Bulgakov, later in Sholkov and so on, and, and attempts also to rehabilitate Krasnov, uh, to rehabilitate um, uh, Kalchak. But legally, uh, the response has been very inconsistent, right? Or, or would you say that there is a, a consistent line of uh, legal 
uh, uh, reactions uh, and re legal regulations in regard to that white box? If I can um, go on, go on, Margarita. Uh, well, uh, as far as I know, uh, all the white uh, leaders who were uh, sentenced uh, sentenced by Soviet to us, uh, those who did not fight the case, except Kalchak, they were. But there is lots of inconsistency, I agree. I can add, I think it's a, it's a good insight on how the, legal, the Russian legal system functions, that it can depend on the year, it can depend on the region, it depends on the administration who is in charge of, of uh, judging. You can have contradictory strategies, contradictory interpretation of the laws. What we were trying to kind of, when we were trying to, to understand the, the logic, what is sure is that those white leaders who are able to leave the, the, without being judged, like the Nikin, can be rehabilitated because you don't have to do any kind of legal proceedings against a Soviet judgment. Those who were judged by the Soviet Union are more difficultly rehabilitated because it means changing the, like going back or overthrowing the Soviet judgment. And as Margarita said, those who participate in, in collaboration are just by definition, if I may say, excluded of any kind of discussion. It's only those who died in the 20s, like Kotschak, who could potentially be rehabilitated because you cannot accuse them of having collaborated with Nazi Germany, but they are still considered as, as, a, as a war criminal. So the system is quite inconsistent, but at the same time is in fact uh, uh, consistent with, with the uh, uh, Soviet logic of being very reticent to changing anything. Thank you. Let me just say to viewers and listeners uh, that there is a chance for you to ask questions if you so wish. Do this through the chat function. I'll be happy to be uh, the moderator in this regard as well. And then uh, Nina, I think uh, you yeah. have a question, please. Right. Yeah. Uh, yes, actually, it's something I wish I had thought of earlier. And talking about the memory of the Civil War, What's missing, actually, is the civil war. I mean, is the brutality of the way the war was fought. I don't know whether you contemporary people have read the most a very dramatic piece by Maxim Gorky called On the Russian Peasantry that he um, published in 1922. And he describes in detail some of the ways in which the Reds tortured the whites and some of the ways in which the whites tortured the reds. I mean, horrible things. And then he said, which side was more brutal, both because both sides were Russian. Um, and so I wondered whether in dis, you know, sort of discussing the memory of the civil war, you know, you had decided to not talk about the way the war itself was waged and the brutality, like so many in civil wars tend to be particularly brutal and this one certainly was. Um, so I wonder whether, you might want to consider that. Yeah, if I may add, I think we were also limited, you know, by the size. At the beginning, we had yeah. a really longer manuscript, especially Margarita had really great historical parts, much more detailed that were cut because the, the, the logic of the series is to make short books. So, so we made it, but, but that cost us a lot of uh, cut on, on many really fascinating aspects. So, so I always told Margarita that she can write a second book with everything <laughs> that we have to cut on all the other fascinating aspects of the discussion. But that's true that we don't have that in the book. And if there are no other uh, questions right now, let me ask you one that I think Eric brought up, and that is about this kind of quiet or silent decommunization. Right? He mentioned that a thousand Lenin monuments have been kind of silently removed. So it's very different from, let's say, the spectacular and loud and media savvy kind of decommunization that we see in and have seen in, in, in Ukraine. But still, is that a process that really is going on, or is that just inertia? What, what is it there? I have to say, I, I have I was unaware of that. If, if that is a trend, that would be a real curious trend to, to think about. Do you mean the removal of uh, Lenin's uh, monuments now? 
Uh, well, I think that the most active phase was in the 1990s. It happened everywhere. Uh, <laughs> I think that uh, probably in my city uh, it was not removed because it's too big and <laughs> technically <laughs> very expensive <laughs> and complicated. And now it's still here, not far from from my house and it became a symbol of our city uh, well uh, there, there are many funny memes memos of uh, uh, this monument so it may be a symbol of reconciliation right now i can't say that uh, um, lenin's monuments are still removed somewhere i don't know um, I don't think so. Those who, uh, those that survived, <laughs> they 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 stand. And there are many actually in my town. Uh, thank you, Boris Kolonitsky. Uh, you have a reaction. Comment. Uh, comment. Uh, yes, some uh, uh, monument. Eric is right. Uh, some monuments were removed without big fuss, uh, so it wasn't. Uh, not overtly political, but technical, if if you if you like. But uh, 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 two things: a, according to public opinion polls, majority of the Russians don't want uh, removal uh, of Lenin's monuments and don't want renaming streets or towns. Um, what it says, it's it's complicated for different reasons. Sometimes, and I pick up uh, the point of Alexander, sometimes for conservative reasons. It's it's bad to touch. We are uh, anti-communist, but it's it's better not to touch it. And the second issue is, yes, some uh, Lenin's monuments were removed, but at the same, same time, some monuments were erected to Lenin and even more to Stalin, right? So I wouldn't say about big decommunization without comments, yeah. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. I was saying it's interesting to look at what Putin has been saying about Lenin, right? Having always a very critical view on him. And I always mention my, my favorite uh, uh, Russia, my history exhibition park where you have the color code. So red is bad and green is good for Russia. And so the period going from the revolution to 1923 on December of 1922 is red and beginning in 1923 when the Soviet Union is created and the civil war is finished, it becomes green again, right? So, so Lenin is just in this period of being <laughs> on the bad side of Bolshevism because that's what the revolution at the same time is such a symbol for all the Soviet state after that I think the regime is now in this kind of mood of not t t touching anything, but just because several of you mentioned the comparison of the US, it's fascinating, I think, to look at, to comparing what happening in the US and in Russia, and to see the, the Russian state strategy of being plural, giving the floor to every group, trying not to touch anything, like, okay, you can do a statue for whoever you want, there is room for everybody, just don't remove anything, but kind of multiply or add <laughs> the level of statues, but not, not remove them. And I think that's the general also, as Boris was saying, public opinion, this impression that, okay, it was not perfect, but still we have to live with the past as it was, right? So it's a, it's a way of managing diversity that is of opinion that is completely different from the US one. I mean, uh, I to also to the, other, um, to the other hands that I'm seeing raised here, Alexander and uh, I think Nina, uh, but it, it, is it, this is a question to all speakers. Would it be justified to say that the attitude of the Russian state uh, toward this, these memory wars and this, these memory politics is actually a pluralistic one, maybe out of convenience, maybe out of a lack of, uh, of an overarching political concept that could um, you know, give a, a stronger and more clear direction to things. But there, there is pluralism, including maybe as Boris has, has uh, touched upon in the scholarly field, 
And that is actually maybe a good thing. So memory politics means to allow for many, many uh, different kinds of memories to coexist with some exceptions. I mean, I think, for example, the scandal that surrounded the erection of the uh, uh, Marshall, Field Marshal Mannerheim um, a monument in, in Petersburg is, is a good sign how far you can go and where there is a red line that you cannot go any further, right? But would pluralism be a justifiable and justified uh, term to, to characterize the memory politics concept and, 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 and strategy, or maybe just tactics, uh, of the current Russian uh, regime. Alexander, would you, would you like to take that question? Yes. yes. Good. Uh, I, I would not call our political regime uh, pluralistic. It would be strange. Oops. Could you turn me up? Uh, do you hear me? Ah, okay. Uh, I would say that... Uh, Okay. I would say that uh, the policy of memory, memory, memory politics of our government uh, is uh, very aggressive, not pluralistic at all, but they avoid topics which are controversial and could alienate some part of potential supporters. So they pay attention to uh, 17th century, to St. Vladimir, uh, to great patriotic war, of course, uh, but it's easy to skip a uh, civil war. There are many political events. Why to talk about that? Uh, and I think that's the policy. Of course, there are active factions who could promote uh, more red or more white policy, but I think general attitude is to skip controversial things. Uh, and we saw it when we uh, our authorities supposed to celebrate or counter celebrate, I don't know what to do with the uh, uh, anniversary, 100th anniversary of the revolution. What they prefer what to do, they prefer, prefer to, to do as, as less as possible. So if there is a conflict avoidance, where is the aggressiveness? Where would you place the aggressiveness? Uh, if, if they want to promote anti-Western attitudes based on uh, events of uh, 1612, it will be aggressive enough. Uh, if uh, any discussions regarding Second World War uh, are on the edge of the uh, criminal law enforcement, uh, that's, I think, it's aggressive enough. But civil war, they prefer just not to mention it. If it's, it's impossible not to mention it all, they try to mention it less. Thank you. Any other opinions in this regard? Nina, is, is your hand up sign, is that meant to be or is it just a leftover from previous? Yes, no, it's not meant to be. Okay. I'll leave it to you. other people, sorry. Okay. Uh, I would say that I agree with Marlene's point of view that uh, it's pluralistic but there is a hierarchy of memories. And it's very clear what, uh, like, uh, like uh, the Second World War is in the center. It's like a, a state narrative, uh, a core of uh, our national identity. And so it's it's uh, above all the other memories and uh, this memory must be fixed must must be certified by the state but uh, other memories like this, about the civil war they can be uh, they they're allowed to be more diverse so right you but some of the great patriotic war, uh, the Second World War, is also a consensus event, right? I mean, it's one that even many emigres, former whites, uh, uh, you know, um, made them change their minds and, and become somewhat pro-Soviet, even somewhat pro-Stalinist, right, in, in, uh, in the war and after the war. Well, uh, uh, as a historian, uh, I, I would say that... Uh, the Second World War and Great Patriotic War are two different things. Of course, of course. No, of course. Yeah. Okay, any other viewpoint? Yes, Nina, please. Yeah, 
just oh i have to unmute myself you are you are unmuted yes, I so um i would recommend the work of um maria lipman um who's written a good deal on monuments and how the plurality comes out in monuments uh and how so this is a flowering of new monuments going up and a monument to ivan grozny um and you know so so many which shows this this uh, acceptance of the plurality and, and and another way another thing that was very interesting to look at was um russian responses to the removal of monuments in the united states um which tended to be very negative you know saying people can't face their own history they shouldn't be removing monuments um and so i think it's it's kind of Take, it's good to take a look at monuments. They're a very in, in, important um, barometer. Any, Eric, please. Yeah, I have, I have two points that have come up. Uh, one is a question for um, the authors, and that is, uh, what about the question of raising of monuments to white figures in history? How widespread uh, have moves in that direction been, and, and what are some examples? Uh, and then the second one is uh, Nina raised this point by quoting Gorky and the the, the violence on both sides in the Civil War. Um, it's, it's striking to me that, in a sense, uh, the current regime is looking for something usable and positive on both sides. Kind of a, I guess, a spin on on uh, our president's uh, uh, famous statement about uh, the University of Virginia, where there there are some good people on both sides, um, rather than saying there are. Um, violent people on both sides and that, that it was a tragedy for the country as a whole. So I, I'm just wondering kind of, um, you know, what that point of view that the Civil War was simply a violent tragedy uh, and both sides are to be blamed, uh, where that point of view stands in the current debate. Thank you. Hey, if I can comment on the on the your last point, Eric. I think yeah, I think that's the the. I mean, the strategy of the regime is to consider that every movement on the ground of population against the state is negative, right? So so the Bolsheviks are negative actors at the moment where they are fighting in a revolutionary mood, right? So I think uh, very clearly it was stated by Medinsky, by Lavrov, the civil war is a tragedy because at the moment where the state is weak and where you have division and you have foreign intervention, so you have, of course, a, a very uh, contemporary reading of what it means to be a, a weak state while being, and, and the, as you said, the, the goal being to show the Russia the strong state, then it can be either the white the, the, or the Tsarist one or the Soviet one, but what is in the middle has just uh, no, no, no legitimacy. And on the, the, the monument to white, we had a part on that and, and Margarita did a, a lot of work and that was really interesting to see the local fights depending on the region of any attempt to uh, erect new status to white leaders and then depending if you have a strong leftist communist party in that region who will kind of uh, try to, to dismiss this attempt then it, it failed or it succeeded and Kolchak has been probably the one who had the most kind of back and forth adventure like post-mortem adventure of having monument or plaque you know uh, put on his name then destroyed and put back and destroyed so you really have active memory fight on the ground in each city where we have debates where really group like really fighting almost literally and legally to to avoid or promote the erection of, of, of new status so that's a really fascinating thing and i think here also i mean the, the regional diversity in russia is really impressive around these these notions that's a great conclusion so we are out of time let me finish by thanking our four panelists, Nina Tumarki, Alexander Verkhovsky, Kalanitsky, and Eric Lohr, and congratulate also the two authors, Marlene Larel and Margarita Karnasheva, on this uh, really interesting and really thought-provoking book. And finally, last but not least, thank Matt Cooley for technically supporting this event. Thank you all, and all the best to you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Bye. <laughs>